Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I am, unsurprisingly, uh, Adam Fowler. Um, I work in VMware in the modern apps team, so Tanzu, everything Kubernetes, databases, anything to help programmers, that's what I do. The last uh, couple of years I've been doing a lot around digital contact tracing, COVID-19 and e-health. So what I'm going to do today is reflect a little bit on what we've learned technology-wise during COVID-19 and how we're now applying that to other areas of health so that everybody uh, benefits going forward. Uh, this is the agenda, so a very brief intro to myself because I hate self-congratulatory slides, so that'll be very quick. Um, and then I'll talk through a little bit about how Bluetooth's evolved and how the problems we found uh, we've solved in the Herald project. Um, I'll then talk about how we're now applying that. So I've got some code samples as well as pictures of hardware that we're doing uh, and lots of different use cases. So making it kind of real for everybody uh, today. Uh, I'm going to run through it fairly quickly because I want to make sure we get plenty of questions uh, at the end. So uh, do you know write them down and uh, let me know at the end if you've got any questions. I'll also have a look forward in you know, some little announcements from the Herald project that I saved up for today as well, uh, and then links to find out more. So this is me. Um, this is the only vaguely decent picture I've got me, unfortunately. So uh, background software engineer, did loads during COVID-19, so I was a lead architect for the UK COVID-19 app, um, and then handed that over when I was part of Pivotal. Pivotal got bought by VMware. I then uh, kind of slept for a month after that project because it was insane. It was like 16 hour days, six day weeks. Um, and then uh, when, well, why is Bluetooth, you know, just sucky on mobile platforms? And is there a better way of doing this kind of stuff? Um, so I went down and did some kind of basic research on that, which we'll talk about in a bit. As well as that, I'm the current TAC chair of Linux Foundation Public Health this year as well. So you'll see me run all the TAC calls as one tomorrow afternoon if you've got uh, some time free about three o'clock we're running that from here um, and I also help out uh, in Open UK on the healthcare data space as a chair and I'm a rapporteur uh, in the standards body Etsy in Europe as well in my copious free time I'm also studying for DPhil clinical medicine uh, at Oxford based on the contact tracing stuff that I've done uh, working to use consumer apps to help people manage their own health conditions better uh, brief aside, because I've been walking around all week and people are probably thinking, well, hang on a minute, why did you work on COVID-19? You've not been wearing a mask all week, so clearly you're an anti-vaxxer, right? Um, I'm not. I'm autistic, so I can't wear masks. Um, I found out the hard way on a train back from the Department of Health to my house, had a full-on panic attack, uh, went non-verbal for 24 hours. It is not pleasant as a 41-year-old male to be completely unable to do anything. So that's why I'm not wearing a mask. That's why I've got mask exempt written everywhere, um, much to the chagrin of the security guys downstairs. Um, but thank you all for wearing a mask. I, we do appreciate it. Um, the reason you're all wearing them isn't because this place has some weird rules. Um, it's because there's some of us that can't. So we really do appreciate it. There's lots of people who have died, who have been disabled and immunocompromised during COVID-19. So it's, uh, it's good that we're still doing it. So thank you for that. Um, but equally, don't police it. Please don't police it yourselves, okay? Um, it's not your job, frankly, uh, and it means, you know, a lot of us. I'm one of the quite outspoken ones. I'm quite out about being autistic, but a third of autistic people are not employed, so we don't tell many people, <laughs> right? So um, please don't try and police it yourselves and go up to people every five minutes and ask them. Just leave them be and just try and always be kind and just don't assume they're an anti-vaxxer, just assume they're autistic and give them a bit of space. Um, the Howard project that we started uh, back in the summer of 2020, the aim is really to help healthcare app developers create applications that pass proximity data. So you're moving around in an environment or you're moving around other people in an environment, um, as well as pass message data. So things like digital contact tracing tokens or any other messaging data, we'll see a few use cases later. And to do that securely and in a way that's privacy preserving uh, with the ultimate aim to improve human health outcomes. So that's why we formed the Howard project. Thanks to the open source team in VMware who are here heckling me today. Um, you know, they helped me kind of get that off the ground because it is a lot of work, especially uh, naming a project. Herald has got nothing to do with Howold. It's not that I can't spell the guy who Bluetooth was named after. That was my 30 second naming option because I'm really bad at naming things as Suzanne, uh, um, open source marketing person will, will tell you. But uh, yeah, VMware open source group helped me uh, kind of kick this off. Um, and then, you know, 
uh, we've donated that to Linux Foundation. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, we support over 98% I mean, of worldwide smartphones. Um, it works in the foreground and background, iOS and Android. We also can be used on wearables and beacons as well. So private systems can be made with it. Um, and it's deployed in Australia in their COVID safe app and it's deployed in Alberta, Canada. So it's got over 7.6 million users worldwide. Um, we're also deployed in a STEM outreach app, which I've just realized, I've not copied this slide into the presentation for, so I'll get a telling off later. Um, but I'll talk to you about that uh, presentation later as well. Uh, we also won the Open UK Software Award last year, which was fantastic. And, and we've been nominated again this year. I didn't nominate us this year. I did last year, but I didn't nominate us this year, so I don't know who's done that, but that's great. It's nice that other people obviously seeing the good work we're doing. Um, but we originally started digital contact tracing, but we've now got a really super reliable Bluetooth layer. So what else can we use that for? And that's what this presentation is about. Um, and because of our success, because we've been working with international governments on lots of different programs and UNDP and uh, you know, other international groups, the Singapore government donated their uh, original open trace code to us um, uh, earlier this year. Um, so we're working on kind of open trace V2 for the next pandemic, whether it's COVID version 12 or something different. Um, but we're not going to talk about COVID today much. We're going to talk about, you know, Bluetooth use and how it's evolved. So um, this is a slightly kind of amusing slide. So this is, this is me, young and innocent, dashing through meadows, as you do if you're from England, right? This is what we do for fun. So this is me, carefree. So what was I using Bluetooth for in 2019? Well, my fantastic Bluetooth headphones, uh, you know, using, going from my phone, playing music to an accessory the headphones or an accessory, the car. That's basically what Bluetooth was pretty much used for, right, in 2019. Um, you know, there's other things like, you know, um, sharing files between your Mac and your phone, which still is ridiculously complicated and requires Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for reasons past and understanding. But mostly these things were designed and tested to do audio reliably, right? Um, and then I got a phone call in 2020. <laughs> I got a phone call from the British government saying, hey, Adam, you can create apps pretty quick. We've got a technical problem that's right up your street. I was like, great, what is it? It's like, well, we need to figure out how far two people are away from each other uh, using the mobile phones that are in their pockets. And I'm like, okay, I can think of a few ways to do that. So I started hacking away um, at a few ways of doing it on the train on the way down to London. I live two hours away from London. Um, got it kind of working that day. I demoed it on a video the next day and then ended up working on the contact tracing project based off the back of that but it was insanely complicated because as soon as you start scratching the surface you realize this really was only tested for audio <laughs> right it wasn't intended to be used as a digital tape measure so this is what i ended up looking like um this is showdown <laughs> like i was like wow uh, it was kind of crazy times um, but what we were fundamentally trying to do and this is an excerpt from uh, ferretti et al which is the the main paper on digital contact tracing for covid19 and the theory of it um, this was really what we were trying to do, is trying to figure out, okay, two people might live with each other, but one of them might go to work, they use public transport, you know, and if they're exposed to somebody, how do we notify people and where do we set thresholds for a close contact that's probably going to fall ill and a kind of nearby contact that we're saying, you don't have to self-isolate, but keep an eye on things, you know, how, where do we set those things? So this was basically the source document and the Oxford team in the Pathogen Dynamics Group, which I'm now lucky enough to be a student in as well, um, they set us this challenge. Um, so I sat down to look at the fundamental science behind it. Um, and we found lots of interesting things along the way, which I'll uh, talk about on the next slide. But then we kind of finished that project and went away and launched Herald. Herald's super, super reliable. So I, I managed to calm down a bit so I don't look like Shodan anymore. So I'm now, this is me, I'll kind of peace, love, and trying to help people with uh, Bluetooth apps, right? Uh, obviously, you know, my hair is slowly growing back. It's not quite that luscious yet, but that's what I'm hoping for. And I've still got my Bluetooth headphones and they work great, right? Which is the important thing. Um, these are particularly brilliant if you're autistic and hate large crowds, by the way. So if you do see me walking around with them, <laughs> then I'm not being ignorant. Feel free to tap me on the shoulder or something. Like, don't go like that, but, you know, um, tap me on the shoulder uh, if you want. It's just, you know, crowds. Um, so that's, that's kind of a faintly amusing timeline, but we did learn an awful lot along the way. Um, the main one being standards are fantastic. Oh, unfortunately, everybody has their own. 
And the problem with standards that have optional components is that different people will implement different optional components in different ways. <laughs> Um, and this, is, this isn't just a dig at anyone in particular. I mean, these things were fundamentally designed to share audio, <laughs> right? They weren't designed to be, um, you know, digital tape measures. So there was lots of issues, some of them in operating system code, some of them in chipsets with specific phones and specific models of phones. Um, but the upshot was that, you know, uh, the, the protocol that ended up being used quite a lot, the Google Apple Explosion Notification or GYN protocol, kind of only works on handsets from the last three years, right? Um, it doesn't work with older phones, which means it's out of reach um, of large swathes of the world's population. And when you consider pandemics don't start uh, normally or often in very rich countries, you, you want to stop it before it becomes a pandemic. So we kind of need to figure out the, the longer tail of it. And also, if you're coming up with any technology that could have wider health benefits, it needs to work on as many phones as possible, right? So this is what we've been looking at in the Herald Project. Um, interestingly, we found that Bluetooth is greatly underutilized. So there's so many optional features of Bluetooth low energy that just aren't used on phones. Um, and this is partly because people have had trouble using the operating systems, APIs for the apps to work reliably in the background as well as the foreground. We've solved that problem, thankfully, touch wood. Um, but it, it was not straightforward and took a lot of research. Um, and unauthenticated Bluetooth for low energy, you know, you pair devices um, in order to share data. But we're fundamentally doing this in an unauthenticated way. We're passing anonymous packets around um, because you're not, you don't, you know, like you don't want to pair your phone with everybody you come into contact with, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's different, you can use Bluetooth low energy in that way, but that's not what most people use it for, but it's a super, super useful thing to do as we'll see later on for location services, like in hospitals and things. And then Bluetooth Mesh, which is based on top of Bluetooth Low Energy, um, but is effectively a particular packet format going over Bluetooth Low Energy with a particular service ID. Um, and that's super useful for when you, it's a flood network paradigm, and we'll talk about this in a moment. Um, it's used primarily like 100% of all the samples you'll ever see is for somebody turning on one light bulb or turning on or off multiple light bulbs, or changing the color of the light bulbs. And people are like, oh, we've got the biggest Bluetooth mesh network in the world. It's got 6,500 nodes in it. It's like, yeah, but what are they? Oh, the light switches. It's like, yeah, that's, that's not an IoT you know, power use case, right? I'm sure we can find more uses for this stuff, which are really useful for healthcare. And then you've got Matter, which is everyone's coming up with their own IoT in-house smart building kind of approach. So you've got, you know, Amazon doing things, you've got Microsoft doing things, um, everyone's doing a, their own different thing, right? Um, this is people going, well, do you know what? If we kind of take an IP network and we take like Bluetooth Low Energy, then we can do something standard um, across everything. So that's, that's brand new and is being worked on by a, a lot of vendors. So there's lots of unexploited potential, basically, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then finally, what we learn as well is there's lots in the literature about Bluetooth distance estimation being unreliable. It's not actually true. It's just that the way they tested it was at a fixed distance or two fixed distances. What I did, because I'm a geek, uh, was created a robot that automated this testing at one centimeter intervals for four minutes per centimeter interval for a variety of different phones. Um, and we came up with this graph. So the RSSI, yes, does go up and down, but it's predictable. So you can create a linear model and then, you know, assuming you don't turn your phone on, stay very still, then turn your phone off, you'll get a useful signal to noise ratio. So that was quite a groundbreaking discovery. And we've got over kind of 8 million data points of raw data that published as open data uh, that people can go in and use and build machine learning models on top of if you want to. But it isn't a di digital tape measure, right? You can't take one reading um, in Bluetooth um, on one phone and compare it against a reading on another phone. So. Um, I've come up with a um, phone self-calibration mechanism, so that's actually been written in the research group at Oxford at the moment. Uh, that's going to be published in the next month or so. So it's a self-calibration mechanism, so your phone, you know, if you fall ill with COVID-19, it's about three and a half days between being exposed and falling ill. Um, this can self-calibrate on your phone going about your normal daily business within 48 hours. So that's well within the range, um, and normally you'll have it installed before. So that's quite a useful thing. So for the first time, you and your friend, you know, like you do when you go out for a walk with your friends, you look at the step count and you go, oh, you've done 200 more steps than me. 
but you kind of accept it because it's kind of you know within kind of seven percent you're fine you know within ten percent you're fine um a proven and we will see in this paper when it's published is that we can get it within seven and a half percent um of two vastly different capable phones um which is super super interesting and then we found some devices kind of misbehave and by misbehave i don't mean they're rubbish devices they're great devices but they don't follow, for example, how Android works with Bluetooth. Like you make a system call and it says, yes, I do support advertising. No, I don't. And it just flat out lies, <laughs> right? Which is kind of unhelpful. And then some things like Apple TVs will proactively try and connect to any other Bluetooth device nearby. So you kind of have to filter them out. Um, so there's all sorts of weird things like that. Uh, blood glucose monitors were a bit of an issue uh, during COVID-19 because you know, people implementing e-health systems, but they're not experts on Bluetooth. So they're implementing it in a non-standard way, and that's causing interoperability and security issues. So what we're trying to do in Herald is come up with a way of doing this so that people can concentrate on the e-health aspect and not concentrate on the low-level Bluetooth aspect, because we've already thought of that. Um, but that was a super interesting uh, finding. So crucially, how are, we, how are we doing this? Well, um, how are we applying this? So first example is uh, smart hospitals. Anybody went to the Zephyr talk? At the start of the week, I went to the mini summit. Uh, so Zephyr is a real-time operating system. It's Apache 2 license, another Linux Foundation project. And I thought, yeah, I don't want to write device drivers, uh, so I'll go and use that. <laughs> so we use that as a basis for a lot of our wearables and beacon stuff. Um, but first example I want to show is smart hospitals. So we started off with, okay, phone-to-phone -phone, um, exposure um, in you know distance estimation, that sort of thing. And then we thought, well, We've got these QR codes in restaurants and in pubs and we're having to scan them. And when you scan them, it just assumes you've been there all day. So it's not great accuracy. So we thought, well, what we can do is we can create a beacon, which has got the same metadata as those QR codes. So what venue you've been at, who owns it, that sort of thing. But it's automatic. So it's, it looks for these beacons and then logs it on your phone. So it's a venue diary in your own phone. So we created that beacon app. Um, I had that running on a Bluetooth dongle that I forgot about outside my house in the cold, freezing Derbyshire weather um, for about 18 months. Um, well, apart from the odd power cut, but it, it restarted and it worked fine. So this is super reliable stuff. Um, and that's just transmitting, you know, I'm Fred's Pizza Palace, and you'll see an example of this in code in a bit. And then we, I thought, well, that's great. That's restaurants, and that's useful for COVID-19, but actually... That's probably useful elsewhere as well. What about an entrance to a hospital? Say, hey, you've just entered a hospital. Would you like to download a map? Because all British hospitals are ridiculously na hard to navigate around, right? So that might be a useful thing to do. And then I thought, well, rather than just download information about the hospital, why not be interactive? Rather than use these kind of check-in machines for my outpatient appointment with COVID-y hands, well, why can't I just do that on my phone and then I'm not touching anything? So I can link that to a hospital system and make that interactive. And then I start thinking, OK, I'm booking in for my appointment. I probably know where that appointment is. So if I download a map and download where my appointment is, um, I can then navigate. So what we ended up doing was thinking, well, if we set up lots of Bluetooth beacons or a mesh of Bluetooth beacons, um, uh, and I've got a digital map I'm downloading to the phone, um, then I can include in that map the location of these beacons. And that phone can triangulate its own position. So it's privacy preserving because it's done on the phone, not in the hospital. They're just transmitting who they are and where they are. And the phone's using that information to figure out where you are. So I could then go, well, actually, your specialist is running you know, 30 minutes late for your cardiology appointment. Um, would you like to, A, go on a healthy walk in the garden, or B, go eat cake in the cafe? I think I'll go eat cake in the cafe. That'll cheer him up. So I'll then navigate using the app to go to the cafe. And then uh, the Frankie and Benny's feature, as I like to call it, uh, other restaurants are available. Um, but the Frankie and Benny's feature, you know, you pick up the thing and it vibrates when your table's ready. When there's one person in with a specialist, it says, hey, you need to go now. And then you can navigate you to the specialist office. So it started off with an idea of, oh, venue beacons are quite useful. But we've now come up with this mesh network in a hospital that we can use for something fairly useful, which is navigating around the hospital or maybe checking into an appointment. But actually, we can make it more useful by applying it to what the hospital people are doing as well. So here's a ridiculously complicated diagram. Um, let's say you've got a Bluetooth mesh. So you've got these four devices here. These are tiny little devices. 
Um, I'm always planning on having one ready to show. Bad staff work. Got one in here somewhere. Anyway, they're tiny little USB devices. They're about yay big, about an inch and a half long. Uh, they don't even have to be that big. Um, so let's assume you plug them in. Say we had a room like this one, it's roughly square for the people remotely. We plug one of these into each corner. We know where they are. And then we can say, well, actually, if we've got a Bluetooth low energy or Bluetooth mesh tag, and we attach that tag to a piece of hospital equipment like a syringe pusher, which apparently go walking quite a lot. Um, interesting thing about hospital equipment, in the UK, the National Health Service spends, buys 20% more hospital equipment than they need because they can't find them when they need them. Some of these carts, simple carts for ECGs or whatever, are over a thousand pounds per car. So that's multiple millions per year, not just in purchasing them, but also in maintaining them. Also in finding them lastminute.com. You know, one of the people I work with, um, her father ended up getting rushed in for a heart attack and they couldn't find a piece of equipment and they had to go and, you know, manually search for it. And like, I need that here now. You know, so these things are real use cases and it could save lives. Um, so you can attach one of these tags to any piece of equipment, you know, add the metadata in, um, and then it will go to sleep when that piece of equipment's not moving, because it'll just say, hey, I'm still here, I'm gonna sleep now, nap, nap time. And it'll go off to save battery, so these tags can last for a couple of years between charges, which is amazing. Um, and then when they do move, it can say, oh, I'm moving. And then all these little beacons can say, well, okay, we're seeing this thing move um, this is the distance I, uh, you know, these are the signal strengths I'm getting from it, and then they can be analysed both on those devices locally as a summary, but also sent to um, what I'm calling the mesh modem, which is how you make a Bluetooth mesh system, instead of being just kind of standalone for light switches and stuff, how you link that to a live system. So what I've come up with is creating effectively one of these Bluetooth things you plug into a server, so, uh, you know, 95% of UK hospitals have two VMware data centers in them, right? Um, so that's interesting in and of itself. Uh, you know, they're in there, nobody knows they're there because they just work, right? Um, but they're, they're in there and, the, you know, it looks like a broom cupboard, it's actually a server room, right? Um, so if you plug a few of these devices in, because it's mesh, there's no single point of failure, um, and then what you can do is you can link that to a messaging system, because this is just a messaging system at the end of the day, so if I flow those messages into RabbitMQ and I can have a web interface that shows where these things are in real time, equally if I'm an administrator, I can program those things remotely and say, okay, where are all my things? If I'm a maintenance guy, where's, you know, serial number 1234, I can go and find that thing, right? Um, and get real-time inventory of all the equipment I've got. And it's not just for equipment as well. Apparently, this is a really worrying statistic. Um, you go in for a biopsy because you think you might have a very nasty disease, so you get a bit, you know, of you chopped out and sent to the lab. They lose those things, <laughs> right? Quite regularly. Um, so actually, you know, one of the hospital trusts I was talking to was like, can we please attach this to a bag so we know where in the hospital that biopsy is so we don't lose this um, and ask somebody to come back in for yet another one causing more concern and more operations. Um, so this is another use case of tracking things. Um, how it physically works, you end up with a Bluetooth mesh like on the right hand side in this diagram um, that has a mesh modem as well as um, each one of those mesh nodes can talk Bluetooth low energy to phones or tags but it can talk Bluetooth mesh to things that are enrolled. Bluetooth mesh is a secure uh, protocol where things have to be enrolled so if you're a visitor you can't use Bluetooth mesh because you're not enrolled as a device but you can use Bluetooth low energy. So these Herald devices talk Bluetooth Low Energy in Herald terms. So we're saying, hey, I'm a beacon, I'm standalone, so a phone can talk to it. But then they talk Bluetooth mesh within the hospital. So you get the best of both worlds, one network. And because it's a mobile network, you don't have to rip out walls or rip out floors and lay cables down, right? You can put these mesh nodes within there. Uh, and the Nogadic chips we use can also do Thread, which is an IPv6 mesh network. So all of a sudden, I've got a dynamic Bluetooth mesh for IoT and messaging data and a streaming IP network in my hospital for not much money, you know, 20 to $30 per node, costs $5,000 to implement this for the average hospital. Nothing in the grand scheme of things. And then I can have in my two, you know, VMware data centers on site, I can have a couple of RabbitMQ nodes, some modern apps written on Kubernetes. Uh, Tanzu Kubernetes is good, by the way. Uh, other Kubernetes are available, but I have to get that obligatory uh, thing in there. Um, 
And here's a few projects. If you want to take a quick <laughs> screen grab of that, um, I'm going to probably post a note after this um, session on the Herald website just to have quick links to this stuff. Um, but all this stuff is open. It's all developed in the open. All our plans on Miro, on a public Miro board, uh, on a public GitHub uh, projects and issues as well. So you can see absolutely everything we're working on. You can comment on it. You can help me work on it and help the other team work on it. Uh, what does this look like in code, though, for people who are trying to implement it? Well, this is the entire kind of non-Zephyr code. So there's some Zephyr code, which is like, I've got an LED, I've got the you know, low-level code, there's not much. But then this is the entire code for that standalone um, beacon I was talking about. That's it. It's like 30 lines of code, and most of that's comments and, um, you know, comments and, and gaps. And I use spaces, not tabs, so I do apologize. Um, but yeah, all we're doing there is saying I want a Zephyr context provider because it's a Zephyr device. So that goes off and talks to Zephyr and goes, OK, I know what the capabilities of this thing are. And then say, uh, I want to use Bluetooth. So get Bluetooth state manager, get the default sensor configuration. So uh, Bluetooth sensor is just like a Herald device. Herald is independent of Bluetooth. So you can implement multiple protocols under it and implement multiple apps on top of it that are independent of what the protocols are. So we support Bluetooth low energy and Bluetooth mesh today, but we're going to add other things in the future as well. Um, so here what we're doing is we're saying Erin, so Erin was one of our uh, labs engineers, so she similarly, uh, she's still got her hair, uh, she survived the COVID-19 project with her hair intact, I didn't obviously, um, so this is Erin's steakhouse because she's from Georgia, so I was like, you're going to have a steakhouse, um, you know, a bit of racial profile on my part there, but she's, uh, she, she does love a steak as it turns out, but yeah, so country, state and code and then some extended data which is basically the text name. So this is kind of compatible with the QR code system that they've been using in New Zealand and they also use in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and then I've just got some debug information at the bottom, which is just kind of sending debug information uh, over Bluetooth as well. And, and then SA.start, sensor array.start is literally telling Herald to go and run in that thread. And that's literally all the code there is for that beacon. Uh, similarly, for kind of more complex things like that mesh modem example, so linking a Bluetooth mesh which is standard Bluetooth mesh, by the way. There's nothing Herald specific in there other than we've added a few models in, but we're following the spec and we're going to contribute these back to the Bluetooth SIG as well. So to get a mesh modem working, it's like a one-liner, <laughs> right? So it's line 159. It's just like continue to process these commands and that's it. Um, and then, you know, that because they're standard models, mesh models, we're just doing the, you know, converting the RabbitMQ message from, from going text over a serial port and converting that to a Bluetooth mesh message and vice versa, that's all it's doing. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then the mesh models, we're trying to stick with the spec. So Linux Foundation, as luck would have it, has a uh, Bluetooth mesh registration. So we're just using that one. Um, and then we define, in this example is a presence message. Um, so then you have like a presence um, struct as well. So country, state, code, and ID again. So these are just standard that work both Bluetooth low energy and Bluetooth mesh. Um, so what else have we done? So disaster communication, so um, either through natural disaster or through uh, violent events that may or may not be happening in Eastern Europe. Um, so uh, disasters, emergency comms, if the internet goes down because it's been taken down, um, you still need to tell people where they can get fresh water from, where they can get food from, where they can get healthcare from, where the medic centres are, um, which ones are busy and which ones are less busy and when to go and when to leave the shelters or not, okay? So this is what we're working on. Um, weirdly, these things sometimes come from, solutions come from weird locations. So I'm a big proponent of Agile. So um, we had some labs time last year and we talked to um, lots of different UNDP countries. So the UN Development Program has IT staff that work within the health systems of different countries. And this was a, a question I actually got given from the Bhutan government saying, okay, we understand how Herald would work for venues and digital contact tracing, that's great. Um, wonder if you could help with a problem. So mounting goat herders. And I'm like, that's, that's a question I was not expecting. Apparently the problem is what, with mounting goat herders, it's, it's not that they're a problem. They were actually worried. They, <laughs> they weren't the problem. They were worried about their health is what they were worried about because they may only go to a town once every two months, which has got internet, but they go through lots of little villages. So they could become ill or worse, they could be asymptomatic and giving it to other people. So how do you get a message to them when they're away for two months without an internet connection? And I thought, well, in Herald, we can just message pass. So why don't we do a store and forward mechanism? And that stayed at the back of my head um, for about six months. And I was thinking, yeah, well, actually, this could lead to a completely decentralized way 
of doing digital contact tracing that doesn't need a server um, or key exchange. It can all be local, passed between people. Like, I'm ill, yes, I've tested positive, and it just gets sent as a message, right? No government control at all. And I was thinking, well, that would be great. And then one of our... Um, uh, one of our contributors who contributes to hardware designs is based in Ukraine. Um, so this is a very real problem, not for goat herders, obviously, but for, you know, uh, internet may or may not go down in certain places for certain reasons. So he was kind of interested in this for an emergency civil comms, how to get a medic and where to find food kind of messages, right? Um, so I was like, well, okay, we've got, had this idea for a while, let's go implement it. So we've actually implemented this in code now. Um, and as Suzanne, who's our open source marketing person, will attest to, I'm terrible at naming things. So this is called the General Purpose Decentralized Messaging Protocol, because um, I'm fantastic at naming things, or GPDMP for short, which is similarly a terrible name. Um, but effectively, the lessons we learn on the left-hand side from kind of Gein and from Herald V1. Um, so Herald V1, so this here, Bluetooth Low Energy 4 and 5, Herald V1 protocol and your payload, so a custom payload, that's what the Australian COVID-19 app and the Alberta Canada COVID-19 app are using. We've standardized on some other payloads, which will enable interoperability. Incidentally, Herald can have a flag turned on to detect GAIN tokens and to detect uh, OpenTrace and BlueTrace tokens. So it's a fully interoperable thing and it just acts just like it would, you know, your app doesn't have to be re-architected for a different underlying COVID-19 or proximity protocol. We'll just say, hey, there's a new device here. Here's its capabilities. Um, so we looked at that and looked at some of the security requirements and we're implementing the Held V2 protocol which has mutual encryption, so anonymous connections still, but mutual encryption which is something that's not built into the Bluetooth spec. So we've been specifying that for a while and then I decided to do a full kind of seven layer ISO model for this so we could put you know, emergency messaging uh, things on top of it. Uh, and then in future, I should mention, in future we can support other things like UWB and Thread and LoRaWAN because it's not specific to Bluetooth. Um, but Bluetooth is the most common protocol on any mobile device in the world at the moment. So how it works, so imagine you download like a Herald personal health utility app, which is coming soon to an app store near you. Uh, I might scan a QR code or download a channel definition file. So it's split into channels and then senders. Uh, senders are also receivers, obviously. They're just people or devices that are in a channel. So very much similar to how Bluetooth Mesh works, um, you know, with network keys and application keys, but we're calling them kind of channels and senders. Um, so I, I say, okay, I've just created um, a channel. It's got a random UUID. Um, I want to share this with my friends so that we can securely communicate. So I share the channel definition and I share, you know, my sender key and he gives me their sender key. And then I go along and I go to my friend in the next town and I add them to the channel and we exchange sender keys, okay? So um, only people with both the channel key can decrypt anything and see that there's different messages from different people and then only people who are both in that channel and have each sender's key can decrypt that key. Equally, it could be a public key. So if it's an announcement from a government saying, you know, a child has been snatched or, you know, um, there's water available here, there's aid available here, um, then it would be a public key that's pre-built into the app, for example. So if you're, you know, an aid agency and you want this app, you know, people in a camp uh, in Syria or somewhere like that to be helped with this, then you could have this as a local comms. Um, so it works very similarly to, if you've seen the Briar project, it works very similar to that, but is kind of cross-protocol, cross-platform and can be used on custom hardware devices as well. Um, so once I'm enrolled, my phone is now listening for Herald messages, either contact tracing or GPDMP, because I'm good at naming things, uh, and passing them on. So it's like, oh, that's a message. Uh, it's not for me. I'm gonna it, I've still got a time to live. I'm going to pass it on. So it's like a mesh network, a dynamic mesh network. Okay. Uh, if it does match one of my keys, then I'm like, oh, there's a new message there. You can decrypt. It's from Fred. He says, uh, yeah, there's some food available over here. I've got pizza. Come around. You know, or more seriously, um, you know, that new aid has arrived. If you've not had aid in a few days, come to this aid post. So initially, we're just going to do plain text messages in this demo app. But in future, um, we've already tested two kilobit audio, but it's lossy. Um, so you can lose 10% of the packets in that audio stream and it still works. Um, you can still listen to it. We've already tested that and it works really well. Um, and it supports, it's not just about live delivery like streaming. It supports delayed delivery and partial delivery, and it supports burst delivery, so you can record a message and burst it. Um, so there's lots of different delivery mechanisms possible, and the way it works, 
is we've got different layers. So the first two layers are like Bluetooth low energy for now, but it could be other protocols. We then have a routing layer, and that's probably provided by the Herald app. And then you could have other apps. So if you look at something like Signal, um, which is a secure messaging app, which can use multiple low-level protocols, you could have a link between Signal and Herald. Um, so that you know, people who use Signal in a country and the broadband goes down, they can still use it by message passing like this. Um, so yeah, so you lost children, civil emergencies, digital contact tracing, there's all sorts of interesting ways of doing this. Um, this is a test. Uh, I do like test room development. So this is a test I wrote for, you know, uh, a layer. So all seven layers to say, oh, we're just in this device with this payload and it gets passed all the way up. So we've already got this code working. Uh, similarly, um, going all the way from layer, <laughs> layer one to layer seven and all the way back again. So sending a message and receiving a message, we can do that. Uh, so this is an example of doing that all in one test. So it's very straightforward code. So as far as an app implementer goes, they implement a couple of interfaces, they're done. Uh, it's all handled in the Herald API, no matter what the bearer protocol is. Obviously, Bluetooth Low Energy today, but others in the future. Uh, finally, uh, what else have we done? Health monitoring and wearables. So, um, as I mentioned, a friend in Ukraine designed um, the middle ones. So you see the Herald logo, um, those devices, they're actually live, they work, they're at my house. I've had to develop extra Zephyr dri device drivers for some of the temperature sensors and the daylight sensors and things like that. But we've got an eHealth platform with daughter boards. The ones at the top are kind of the, the Nordic Semiconductor demo boards. Uh, they're really good. Uh, i got one with me today. And the ones at the bottom, one of the contributing companies to Herald is Face Drive in Canada. They actually do a private digital contact tracing system using some of this technology um, for like airlines and sports clubs and things who can't carry the phones with them when they're working. And again, Here's the code. So on device analytics, this is you know, privacy in healthcare is a really big thing. Um, we don't want to give our data to the Apples and Googles of this world. You really, really shouldn't. Uh, you want it on your device. You want to do the analytics on your device. So I can give you the, pro I can give you the uh, analysis routine, but it runs on your device. So this is how we do it. We have a lightweight in-memory analysis API. So this is a test. So this is just RSSI to distance. So produce some RSSIs. Then say, I've got a distance analyzer. This is just a basic one for testing. Um, and the delegate basically says, hey, you've got a new distance available. So we then run it at different time specs. Um, and then uh, say, yeah, okay, yeah, here's the outputs of those. Um, the overhead of that entire analysis API uh, is 16 bytes of memory on an embedded microcontroller. Right, so massive API. But if you're a scientist, you're not going to implement low-level embedded code, but you might write a C++ class that takes one thing or, or multiple inputs, runs some analysis over it and spits out an output. And that's the way this has been designed. So how has this been applied as well? So personal health monitoring I mentioned as well. So social mixing score. So this is actually running on my uh, phone here. So I'm, I'm doing some testing whilst I'm over here because obviously there's lots of different places I'm going. So, uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's detecting uh, Bluetooth devices. As we go, I think earlier I had some like 250,000 detections, you know, eight, 18,000 reads and things like that. And what this basically does is like a, a step counter. Um, it will uh, do your social mixing score. So I'm going to release that because the problem with digital contact tracing apps is they tell you after you've been exposed that you're about to fall ill, which is a little bit concerning. So what we're trying to do here is say, well, okay, let's move that back a bit. Like you monitor your steps to keep your heart healthy. Why don't you monitor your social mixing? So in a COVID-19 scenario, you might say, OK, I did 16,000 uh, score point, you know, social mixing score in the last day. The government says, oh, we might be going towards a lockdown unless everybody can lower their mix in a bit. So now I decide to police myself to keep it down below 12,000. So we avoid lockdowns, right? Vice versa, if you're autistic like me, you don't like mixing much, <laughs> right? So um, you might have a score of zero for days on end. That's the way we like it sometimes. That's my autism. Other people's autism is different, but yeah, I like sitting on my own doing stuff, but I really should go out and socialize occasionally. Uh, also, if we're in situations where we've been in very close contact for a long period of time, we get very tired very quickly um, and we can have meltdowns, right? You've probably seen you know, some kids do that. It gets a bit easier to manage when you get older. But we can also build an, an app or on a wearable to help people like me uh, to avoid meltdowns, which is a great way of uh, thinking about it as well. So finally, I've not got my one minute thing held up yet, so I'm doing well. So finally, what's coming next? So 
um, looking to build, based on the eHealth wearable we've got, looking to build um, an eHealth makers kit. So like you get your Raspberry Pis and your RP2040s to do like wearable um, stuff. Looking to do this, so you have a smartwatch that's got different a main board, but different daughter boards you can plug into it. So one daughter board can monitor skin temperature, um, uh, blood oxygenation, and pulse rate, and then you can write your own little code for that. And one board at the front might be for a display, so with buttons on it. Um, and then you you know the Herald personal health utility app. Again, I'm really bad at naming things. Somebody give me a name for that, please. Um, but that could be used to kind of interact with that wearable so you can do your own little hacking public health experiments. And we've got a great example of STEM outreach using Herald already. So University of Massachusetts Medical created an app called Operation Outbreak before COVID-19, I hasten to add. And it was a STEM outreach app. So they basically go into a school, all the kids and teachers would download this app um, and they'd make one kid, um, you know, patient zero, COVID Mary right so with COVID Mary going around going shh I'm the one making people ill you can literally go on the Operation Outbreak website it's hilarious so that person their phone would give them a fake disease and it'd spread and they had to put in different controls and decide how to respond to that in a public health crisis great idea um, and uh, you know they, they were using a commercial Bluetooth layer um, but they stopped supporting that so they approached me about it and we're supporting them they're now contributing code into Herald they're contributing the new UI um, end as well uh, so that's great. And my final announcement is what I am looking at doing, not just in the Herald project, but generally, one of the problems we've had is we can't sign contracts as a Linux Foundation project. We can't have contracts with device manufacturers, T-shirt manufacturers. We can't bid for projects and to provide things and sell things to people. Um, however, if you organize in the UK a company that say charitable, has a charitable purpose, you can trade and you can also be on the giving fund websites for things like bright funds um, so that's what I'm looking at doing I've already got some potential board members uh, in that as well um, so we're looking at doing that to fund not just the Howard project but more any project will be able to bid for funds and say we want to do this in the e-health space and then those funds can be directed to those projects so that's my last announcement uh, where to find out more HerwardProx.io um, or the Herald Project GitHub site or come and chat to me I'm easily stalkable on the interwebs You'll find me everywhere, looking kind of bold with a very dodgy smile. Uh, so I don't do smiling. Um, so, yeah. And then there's loads of COVID-19 epidemiology app, um, papers. All the Oxford ones are open access. So if you go to science website, and uh, there was a link early in, in the slides, they're all open access. You can read them and, and understand how these things work so that people don't fear them. Uh, but that is the end of my presentation. I'm beyond time. So any questions anywhere? I don't think there will be. Thank you very much for your time.